Good Monday morning of the sixth week in ordinary time. Actually, as you know, this is actually, today is Friday morning of the fourth week. I'm trying to get these videos done <laughs> today and tomorrow. I have to tell you, or else it's on my mind. It weighs heavily on me. I said, oh my God, I got to do this. I got to get it done. Uh, Lily grabbed my chair, of course, naturally. That's why I'm in the rocker. She says, you're old, sit in the rocker. Anyway, today is the reading. I'm going to stick with St. James all week because he's powerful writing, okay? And I had to look him up, I have to tell you the truth, because he's, he's way over my head, okay? But it's an interesting thing. He appears, they don't know who he is, actually. They're not quite sure, at least the commentators I read. <laughs> I always presumed he was the brother of John, but he's not, he's maybe, but not really. He seems to be, it says, brother of the Lord, and he seems to be the head of the Church of Jerusalem. And he's very, very literate. This guy is smart. Not that the brother of John is not smart, but this guy is very smart, and he's a master of the Greek language. That's what makes them wonder, who is this guy, okay? Because he writes within the medium of Greek wisdom literature. This is a wisdom literature, okay? This isn't your normal kind of letter. And the why you see that, and I'll show it to you in a second, he focuses on wisdom, and yet he is a Jewish Christian because he applies it. He doesn't, it's not ethereal. The wisdom acts, acts out in action and it is rooted ultimately in faith. You won't get a Greek saying that, I don't think so, no you won't. That uh, wisdom lies in, the, in faith in a person, see. You gotta look at Plato to see this, not, it's an idea. It's, Wisdom would lie in the comprehension of the good as an idea, the pure good, okay? All right? That's Plato. James says all wisdom comes from above. He's talking about the Godhead. God gives us wisdom if we pray for it in faith and with faith. In whom? In Christ. And for what purpose? The well-being of the community, the wisdom of the church. A suffering church. These guys must be getting their brains knocked out at this time when he writes this thing because he's encouraging them. It's the head of the church, he's encouraging him. And watch the interplay. This is the introduction. Okay, I'll read it to you. All right? So he said, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in dispersion, greeting. What 12? That's the famous line of 12 tribes of Israel, the Jews. But he's in Jerusalem. And the, the prophetic tradition said the 12 tribes in dispersion would come back to Jerusalem. What's Jerusalem? What's he talking about? He's talking about the peoples of the world now who come to Jerusalem, but it's the new Jerusalem. Which new one? You mean the physical place? It's not. The new Jerusalem is the church. So he, anyone reading this would know what he's saying. He's using biblical language, but he's doing it globally, not solely for Jewish Christians, but for the community of faith. He has to because he's going to make an appeal to something that is not exactly common in the Jewish tradition, but common in the Mediterranean world of Greek thought, you see? This is about 60 AD, okay? So he says, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let per perseverance be perfect, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, to, perse to persevere in the faith amidst the suffering that comes from the faith in the community, in the life of the society you live in, which was very hostile, okay? But then he goes on, watch what he says. But if any of you lack wisdom, that is Sophia, that's an appeal, that's Greek. That isn't Jewish, that's Greek. If any of you uh, lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and he will be given it. So to seek wisdom, one has to ask for it in faith through prayer. Lord, make me wise. Remember the blind man? Lord, that I may see. Seeing doesn't mean, geez, I get a new pair of glasses. You know what I mean? I go to Dr. Scotino, he gives me new glasses. It doesn't work that way. When he says seeing, is to see and touch the real. And wisdom is to be embraced by that which is real. And what is real is personal. It's Christ. Christ is the incarnation of wisdom itself, the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God. You see? See? But he should ask in faith, 
not doubting. Okay? For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed about by the wind. See? For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord since he is a man of two minds, unstable in all his ways. See, if you have both faith and doubt, you're going to vacillate. Boy, does he have that right. Once you lose your faith, that is, or once you don't believe from the totality of your heart and mind, then you're going to vacillate. And once you vacillate, it's all over. You're going to be of two minds. Boy, the ancient Greeks understood that too. I'm telling you, what, what the New Testament does, it makes it personal, not philosophical. The Greeks were philosophers. The Jewish Christians were believers. And there's a difference. And I can tell you, once you submit the narrative of faith, which is personal, to analysis and doubt, it loses its power to hold, to be a wisdom for you. It becomes a problem. And once it becomes a problem, it's over. You lose the person. You want an analogy with that? I'm going to make it short here. When you love somebody, you, you love them, you love them from your heart. You don't question them. You love them. And in the intimacy of the love, you touch them. It's a wisdom rooted in love. You are wise in seeing whom you love and are loved by. You question that. You step back from that and ask, does she love me? Does he love me? Or why she loves me? Or why I love her or him, as the case may be? You're in trouble. There ain't a guy out there that doesn't have a marriage problem, doesn't know that's right what I'm saying. Once that doubt kicks in, everything, the, all the intimacy is lost. It's no longer intimate, it's problematic. That's what James is saying here. You see, you can't question, you have to follow. You follow the wise and the beautiful and you embrace the wise and the beautiful and the good with the totality of your heart and soul. It's an enormous act of trust. Trust in the God in whom you believe and it becomes a wisdom because that light will then become the wisdom by which you see all other things in the world and in life itself. It's an illumination, see? It's not a set of propositions, it's personal. And that's what James is saying here, right? See, that's the truth. It's a wisdom. You could see the Bible as a set of biblical stories about God and, and, and the Jews and then Christians, or you can also see it implicit within, and this is definitely the New Testament and definitely the letters, okay? It's a wisdom. They are participant in the wisdom literature. I think John, the John's Gospel is a quintessential example, but so are the later, the later, the later writings of St. Paul. And so is this. This is a wisdom literature. He's not telling stories. He's encouraging the believer to trust in the God in whom you believe, and you will become wise in your faith. You will see all things. When St. Paul says, we fill up those things wanting in the suffering of Christ, that is more than a description. It's a wisdom. It's looking at life intimately as a participation in the wounded Christ. You see, we are the wounded Christ. The church is the wounded Christ. Once you see that, and when, but you can't just recognize it philosophically. Once you embrace it through faith and an intimacy of love that goes with the faith, then it illuminates every aspect of your life, from life to death and death to life. It's a wisdom in which you embrace the God you believe in, who's incarnate and wounded. You share in that woundedness. That's a great part of St. Paul's later writings. The letter to the Colossians is a work of genius. We fill up those things wanting in the suffering of Christ. See, that's a wisdom. That's a wisdom. That's a Christocentric wisdom. A Greek philosopher could never have said that. But a Christian philosopher, a Christian believer can because in Christ and in the wounds of Christ, one recognizes the wounded church and also one's own woundedness. And then that is a profound wisdom. It gives hope and light and wisdom and light to life itself. It dispels the darkness of confusion and ignorance. It illumines and it liberates to its illumination.